Here's a deceptively simple question. What is American cuisine? I'm sure we can all name examples of stereotypically American foods, pizza, burgers, fries, but can anyone name the criteria that make all three of these foods American? It's not country of origin, pizza knocks that out. Um, they're all a bit processed and heavy, but that's not really enough to make a food American. They're all widely consumed here in the US, but so is sushi. There isn't one criterion that applies to all American foods, besides the fact that Americans consider them as such, even if we can't say why. So to think about and understand American cuisine, a criteria-based approach isn't gonna work. We need a new scaffolding. But why should we even care? It's not like you have to understand the philosophical implications of your burger to enjoy it. At least, I don't. Well, I think a question a lot of us are asking right now is how do we define America? And America is a proudly pluralistic nation. To be American doesn't depend on your race, ethnicity, creed, not even your language or your place of birth. We don't expect to have those things in common with all Americans. What we share is culture. So when we're asking how do we define America, what we're really asking is how do we define American culture? What do we all hold in common or what should we all hold in common? And cuisine is culture. If you ask me for a definition of American culture, I'll first ask you for one of American cuisine. Now, before we go any further, I wanna clarify that when I say America or American, I'm referring to the United States. It's an imperfect designation that invites a whole other conversation about definition and identity, but that's the convention I'm gonna to use today. So, let's try a new approach to American cuisine, a historical case study. Our subject, of course, is ketchup. And ketchup is the king of American condiments, but although it's king, it's also common. It's pretty inexpensive, it's available everywhere, and it doesn't belong to any one American region or class or group. Ketchup also made me very aware of my own Americanness. I love ketchup, obviously, but when I studied abroad in Europe, ketchup was scarce, and depending on the convictions of your waiter, asking for it risked offense. I actually took to carrying around like little packets of Heinz in my purse so that I didn't horrify the wait staff. But in a way, I understand their distaste for that particular American habit. Putting ketchup on a European food doesn't make it American, but there's a certain symbolic assertion of Americanness in that. But I wasn't trying to wage a symbolic cultural war by eating my patate al forno with ketchup. I just really love ketchup. But cuisine and cultural identity are inextricable. Food is one of the most common and also personal ways that we engage with our own culture and with others. So while I might have just seen a delicious crispy carbohydrate that could only be enhanced with ketchup, a waiter might have seen an utter disrespect for culinary tradition and a congenital American unwillingness to properly engage with a foreign culture. And let it be known that I did eat plenty of classic European dishes without desecrating them with ketchup, okay? But I was abroad for a whole semester and sometimes I missed home. And for me, a little bit of America was stored in those Heinz packets. But where did ketchup come from? I looked into it. <laughs> and obviously, I am many magnitudes more excited about ketchup than most sane adults. But I don't think that that should be the case because this is a really interesting story. So here's what happened. At the end of the 17th century, British explorers encountered fermented fish and soy sauces in Southeast Asia. And they had long been a tradition in European cuisine of like fermented and pickled sauces. So they were familiar with these flavors and they liked the new versions of them and brought them back to the British Isles. In the 18th century, British cooks began riffing on these recipes and adapting them for the ingredients that they had at hand. 
So they would ferment and cook down mushrooms and walnuts and fish products and add flavor and longevity with exotic spices and local seasonings and vinegar and alcohol. These early ketchups would not be recognizable to us today as ketchup, but they became very popular in the British Isles and this popularity was exported to the British colonies of the Americas. So you might have noticed that I haven't yet mentioned the tomato. That's because these early ketchups were a fusion of British and Southeastern Asian traditions and the tomato is not native to either setting. But the American cooks, like the British, adapted the recipes for the ingredients they had at hand. One of which was the tomato um, introduced into the US by the Spanish. So in the 19th century, tomato-based ketchups became popular, but they still weren't anything that you wanted to dip your fries into. They were still watery and fermented and heavily spiced. But as sugar imports from the Caribbean rose, the price of sugar fell, and American cuisine as a whole became a lot sweeter. Some cooks started adding small amounts of sugar to their tomato ketchups to counteract the acidity of the tomatoes. And this required more vinegar to balance out the sweetness and so on and so forth until finally there was a prototype of our sweet and tangy tomato-based ketchup. Now, as all this was going on, the canning and bottling industry was setting the stage for the next revolution in ketchup, mass commercial production. Early commercial ketchups were made from the refuse that collected on the floors of tomato canneries and this slop, as it was so appetizingly called, was scraped up off the floor and thrown into barrels to ferment until eventually it was cooked down and a lot of vinegar and spices were added to disguise the taste of decay. Obviously, spoilage and contamination issues were rampant, but still somehow commercial tomato ketchup became very popular and the industry ballooned. Over time, manufacturers realized that consumers preferred an unfermented product, which was even more prone to spoilage, and a nice ruby red color. So they began adding in preservatives and dyes of various levels of safety. Ketchup wasn't the only tainted product. The entire food industry was corrupt with all manner of skullduggery. And eventually, public outrage reached a fever pitch, and in 1906, the Pure Food and Drug Act was passed, which finally established quality and labeling standards at a federal level. But even before that act was passed, the ketchup industry was embroiled in a bitter feud about the potential regulation of these additives. Some manufacturers argued that they were safe and even necessary for safety, but the crusaders of the pure food movement and some other ketchup manufacturers argued that they were symptomatic of dishonest and cut rate manufacturing practices. One of those manufacturers, Heinz, had found that it was quite possible to make high quality additive free ketchup that didn't spoil. So they pulled preservatives and dyes from all of their products and launched a successful PR campaign against additives to woo consumers. In the end, preservatives and ketchup weren't banned, but the court of public opinion, coupled with increasing quality standards at both the federal and state levels, led most manufacturers to abandon the use of additives in ketchup. This could easily be done by increasing the amount of salt, vinegar, sugar, and tomato pulp, and by using high quality ripe tomatoes instead of slop and processing them in a sanitary way. Go figure. Um, and incidentally, the requirements of that method clinched the final form of modern ketchup, which was even thicker, even sweeter, and even tangier. Okay, so how much of this quintessentially American condiment is actually American? It's based on a British version of an Asian sauce that was adapted in the States for a fruit native to South America, and it takes its present form because of the necessities of mass production and the onset of regulations in the food industry. Maybe it's American because of all these things. Cultural syncretism, resourcefulness, consumerism, the tug of war between industry and regulation. So, full disclosure, 
I knew this whole time that the story of ketchup wasn't gonna show us exactly how to define American cuisine. I told it anyway because I think it's a great story. Um, and also because it shows us why it's so hard to do that. Where our food comes from, physically and conceptually, is a jumble of history, industry, globalization, and politics. And where our food comes from, our culture does too. Eating is so integrated with our daily lives that it's almost unremarkable, and yet so intertwined with the way that we construct our cultural identities and all that those entail. Biases, norms, expectations, how we delineate what is ours and what is other. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing. We shouldn't shun cultural identities or the little ways that we construct and refer to them in our daily lives. The danger is in neglecting to consider how and why we construct those identities in the ways that we do. Because when they become opaque and their boundaries become impermeable, we lose insight. We lose the ability to build bridges with others based on what we share. And instead, we build walls based on what we don't. The lesson of ketchup is that cuisine, like the rest of culture, eludes strict definition. But it comes from somewhere. The same historical processes shape them both. Southern cuisine was heavily influenced by the contributions of the black community. The filet o fish was invented by a Catholic McDonald's franchise owner as an option for those who abstain from meat on Fridays. Food is a joyful and approachable place to begin exploring our cultural identities, where they come from, how we construct them, where their boundaries lie. So I invite you all to just once in a while, contemplate your food, have a conversation about what it is and where it comes from. And you'll probably find that those boundaries are a lot less defined than you think. Thank you.